The Storytelling MD has advice for you and me. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 230th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, Sales for your host. If you missed last week, go back. I had the one and only John Carlton, the most ripped off copywriter alive. I've known John for years, known of him for years, followed his work, read his work, bought his material, uh, read his blog, we're friends on Facebook, he posts some great insights. Uh, so having him on the podcast was a real thrill. This guy goes back decades, uh, working directly with many of the greats like Gary Halbert, and we go into those stories. Uh, but it's just timeless success stories on what you can do today to make money today and tomorrow. Uh, and if you think uh, he's too old, right, and his stuff doesn't apply, then you are sadly mistaken. He was a leader in the space, really helping bring about a lot of the things you see these guru internet marketers using today, like video uh, sales letters and these long sales copy landing pages. And, you know, he was at the cutting edge of this stuff. Uh, and the principles do not change. The medium may change, but the message, the persuasion, how you move people never, ever changes. So hearing advice from somebody like John is going to help you in your business. Okay, so check that out. Uh, today we've got Mr. Michael Davis. Uh, it's pretty cool, you know, his name, and he, he gets into it. You know, his uh, name is not unique, Michael and Davis, but the initials were MD, and he talks about how he uh, turned that into the storytelling MD, so you are in for a treat today. Uh, I was going to talk about uh, a book that I just finished. I actually listened to it twice and uh, called Essentialism by Greg McEwen, and uh, a lot of people have talked about it. And, um, you know, I, I listened to this quite a while ago, a couple years ago, and it kind of sunk in but kind of didn't. And so I actually listened to it again uh, twice, listened to it at double speed. Then I listened to it at two and a half speed. He's got a British accent. So a lot of times I listen to things at triple speed. Uh, you can do it. And, uh, but, you know, listening to it at double speed and then again at two and a half, I actually got through it twice faster than you would get through it listening to it just once uh, at regular speed. And so, and I do that for a couple of reasons. You know, this podcast, you can go in and change the speed of this. Uh, and listen at one and a half or double speed. I listen to all spoken things at at least double speed, and it really helps drive home the point. But um, I, you know, I won a little contest. I got a one-year uh, supply, <laughs> one year's worth of credits on um, audiobooks.com, I think it is. So I got the audio version of this, and and it was powerful. And now I'm going back through the physical book and highlighting things that I heard in the. Uh, on the audio side of things, kind of pulling out quotes and stuff and, and um, you know, different sayings from the past. And it is, it is quite powerful. And I'll get into some of the specifics here in the next couple of episodes, uh, give you kind of the Reader's Digest version. But um, I'm going to slow this one down, get into a little something I've gotten into lately. And I'll, and I'll make this quick because I've got to go to jujitsu class. Um, you know, I did every physical thing at the Air Force Academy because we all had to. We took boxing. We took wrestling. Uh, we took self-defense, you know, and then, of course, the basic training, you go through the obstacle course and the confidence course and all these different things. Uh, but I didn't stick with any type of martial art. And um, so for the last couple of weeks, I've been going, man, I am sore every which way but Sunday. Uh, and I realized that we all suffer from ADD. And that ADD is adventure deficit disorder. Uh, I go here in the middle of the day. The class is uh, from noon to one thirty. You know, I get there early and warm up a little bit and then I stay a little bit late. You know, so I'm gone two and a half hours easy. And the nice thing is working for myself, I can do that, right? I can schedule it. Now I wake up early, you know, I'm up by four thirty, four forty five. Uh, I get stuff done, you know, so I'll work from four thirty in the morning or five o'clock uh, until eleven thirty. And then come back and get stuff done. Uh, but you can get more done faster when you focus, when you have a reason to get out of bed, when you've got a spring in your step. You know, Zig Ziglar always told the story about the, the day before vacation. 
I bet you got a lot of stuff done, and we all do because we're focused. We have a list. We have priorities, and we don't let the frivolous things get in the way. We don't get into Facebook debates the day before vacation because we got to get stuff done and get on the plane. Okay, we need to pay ourselves first. And I cover that in all of my training, my make every sale course and and everything else that I I talk about. Chunk down your time and pay yourself first. Now, that means literally pay yourself first, set aside savings out of every check, uh, every bit of income that you make, but also pay yourself in terms of what's important. You know, so after jujitsu today, I'll come back, I'll get about an hour's worth of work in, uh, publish this episode, and I'm going to my daughter's soccer game at 315. Okay, I'll get back. We'll probably go to dinner after that, get back at maybe six, and I'll work for a couple of more hours. Okay, but I'm taking, you know, five hours off in the middle of the day. So, and I was home, you know, for the kids for breakfast. So today's my daughter's 17th birthday. So I was home this morning, have breakfast with her and see her open her presents before she went to Disneyland. So I have that type of flexibility and that freedom. Uh, But, you know, pay yourself first, schedule your life, and then squeeze your work in around the life that you want to live. Too many people just let work spill over and then their life takes a beating, right? Their life suffers. Everybody says, Oh, I do this for my family. I do this for my children. I do this for my spouse. And then you grind away. Admit it. You do this for yourself and, or you do this because you've lost sight of yourself you have given up you you've allowed momentum like like a rip current right like a rip tide to just pull you out into the depths and now you can't even see the horizon so all you're doing is paddling furiously doggy paddling trying to stay afloat and that's no way to live so you know, pay yourself first. Schedule in the things. Schedule in time for the gym. So if you looked at my calendar, you'll see in the mornings, you know, writing blog posts, leaving blog comments on people that I read and follow. Uh, I go to daily mass. I go to the gym. I get my swimming in. Now I've got jujitsu. Uh, and I know ahead of time, right? Some days I can't make it at noon. There's just things come up. There's evening classes, so I'll just schedule those. I schedule them on Saturday. I schedule things around my daughter's soccer games. You know, I don't miss family events. Mondays, I do the podcast, and I have this scheduled. You know, today I'm doing it on uh, on a Tuesday, but uh, I had four interviews yesterday. Uh, so Mondays are typically my interview and production day. But I was traveling last week for five days, so I'm a little bit off. Uh, but I knew it going in, right? And so... So pay yourself first, schedule your life. And instead of trying to work 10 or 12 hour days, see if you can get it done in eight hours. See if you can get it done in six, maybe you can get it done in five. Maybe that means you need to hire an assistant, outsource some things. Maybe you just need to stop doing so much stupid stuff, stupid, unproductive, fruitless, worthless, frustrating stuff. Read more good books, watch less sports. Okay, turn off the news, go join a jiu-jitsu class, take up a challenge like I did with the Frogman Swim. Three years ago, I had never done an open water swim, you know, with goggles, with a wetsuit for any real distance. I swam a half mile out to a rock in the, in the Pacific Ocean here with nothing and swam back. But that was more of uh, just to do it with a buddy. And I blogged about that as well. It was interesting, but that was years ago. But I bit off more than I could chew. I set a big goal and I did it. And now I've done it three years in a row and it's a great event. Okay. So schedule your life first, pay yourself first. Then when you get going, you'll be more effective. You'll be more persuasive. You'll be more convincing. You'll make more sales. Okay. So I want to open with that lead in now to Michael Davis. He has some great stories about telling stories about how he came to discover how telling stories helped him close more of the room, convert more of the room, turn them into prospects and then paying customers. Okay. So you're in for a treat as always. Thanks for listening. Now let's bring on our guest, Michael Davis, all the way from Cincinnati, Ohio, speaking CPR.com. Welcome to the sales podcast. How the heck are you? 
I'm doing very well. Well, Wes and yourself. I'm good. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming on the show. I uh, I was checking you out. You're telling me you were checking me out. So I don't know. I'm kind of right. I'm, now I'm kind of freaked out because I'm supposed to be doing the <laughs> check in. You know, I'm asking the questions here. Um, but hey, I like your site and what you do. And and you know, I'm a speaker. I'm always trying to get better. I'm always encouraging my listeners, and clients. You got to speak. Got to speak. Um, exactly. But I love your homepage. You know, stand up, stand out, and you have the four questions when you speak. Do you receive the following results? People approach you to arrange one-on-one meetings. They buy more of your products or services. They refer you to other groups. They hire you on the spot. And I know, I know I've, I've skinned my knees, bloodied my nose many a times, but I know by and large, most of our listeners uh, would have to answer no, probably to all of those. And that's probably why you came up with those questions, isn't it? Exactly. I want people thinking about what is the end result of what you do rather than what do you do? Right. At least at first. The old begin with the end in mind, huh? Yes. A huge proponent of Stephen Covey. (laughs) So, uh, so your, your tagline or your title is the storytelling MD. Um, Why do you have that name? Well, I had created, well, with some help with some friends, we created the concept of speaking CPR, of giving life to lifeless presentations. <laughs> and one of the challenges I have in life, Wes, is I was born or given a name, Michael Davis. And I know you nor anyone listening knows anybody else named Michael Davis. It's a very rare name, I know. <laughs> but we, we talked about this one yeah. day. So how can I bring something unique to it? And I, my, one of my friends said, well, your initials are MD, and your company name is Speaking CPR. Why don't we work on that? And so I came up with this concept that nice. I admire doctors for the work they do, 8, 12, 16 years to earn that medical degree. And I thought, you know, they do it. They, they go about it the hard way. My path was become a, a fanatic, almost obsessed with storytelling and speaking, and then have the good fortune to be born with the initials MD. Right. Put them together. There you go. Very nice. All right. That kind of makes sense. Hey, a, a quick technical uh, point. Can you, uh, your microphone's kind of rubbing your shirt. Um, can you just make sure it kind of hangs out a little bit? I sure can. Oh, oh, that sounds much better. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, so, all right. So those are your initial, and you know what? And I, and I'm always telling people like, cause people are like, you know, why are you the sales whisperer? It's like, cause I just made it up and I sent the government 800 or a thousand dollars and they put the little trademark R thingy after my name. That's why. That's it. <laughs> you know, right. A good friend of mine, I had, I had him on this, uh, Mike Stromso. He calls himself the insurance doctor and he, he, ro- he walks around with a lab coat, right. And it's a big the scope that's hard to say for me yeah uh, and he's got a prescription pad uh just like a doctor and he's I writing insurance it. quotes and it, and it stands a, out yeah you know when i first started doing it i thought i'm really not sure about this it was way out of my comfort zone and at the time i was in the financial planning business and i had some physician clients so i went to them and, and i said here's my idea for the storytelling md i told them what i had just told you they loved it right they said Run with it. So don't be afraid to test it out amongst people who you think it might offend. (laughs) Well, it's so funny. Like you say that, like we're all, what do they call it? Like like the curse of knowledge, right? We're we're too close to ourselves. And it's like, I didn't question you at all. I see the storytelling MD. Okay. That's who he is. Uh, (laughs) You know, it's like, you're all worried about it. And I see it and go, that's just natural. That's a good name. That dude's smart. I I appreciate that. (laughs) Tell that to my kids. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, really. I'll tell them yours. You tell mine, okay? I'm happy to do that. Uh, so why storytelling, though? That's a unique spin on speaking and presenting. It was quite by accident. I, when I was in the financial planning business, I was given the task of giving uh, workshops in the area. And one night back in 2008, I was giving a program called Wine, Women, and Wealth. It was the first time we'd ever done it. I was the only man in a room with 21 women. And I started my presentation. And have you ever had one of those moments when you're in a conversation with either a person or or even in front of an audience and you know it's not going well? Uh, No, all of mine are fabulous. All of mine are fabulous. We we may have to end this interview. I thought you were a pro, man. (laughs) (laughs) 
it, it was one of those. And what do we usually do when that happens? Well, we ignore it. We fight through it because we know we're such good communicators. We're, we're just going to wow them. Well, five minutes later, it wasn't happening. And I finally stopped and I decided to address the group and said, ladies, I feel like something's wrong here. Can you tell me what's going on? I want you to get the most out of this. I don't want this to be a waste of your time. Right. And the, the, the end result of it was out of desperation, I threw a story out at them, something that had happened 20 years before with my mother and some financial struggles she was having. The women loved the story, completely changed the atmosphere in the room, and that night was a huge success. Now, that's the kind of the feel-good part of it. The tangible benefit was at the end of the night, whereas we normally had 20% people sign up for individual meetings, we had 57%. Ooh. Now, that was a one-time test, and it was by accident, and I thought it couldn't be that easy by throwing stories in. You know, for about six months, we tested it, and sure enough, stories proved to be a huge benefit to getting more people to sign up. Right. It That's sent awesome. me on a path. I was so fascinated by it, Wes, that eventually it got me out of the financial business because I decided I want to be a speaker and coach and help other people gain the benefits I have from this fascinating uh, communication tool that we've actually been using uh, since day one that we could communicate. Right. All right, so that's so that's awesome. So you you kind of stumble across this, but now how do you how do you know what stories, right? How do you how do you tangibly uh, and um, objectively sprinkle more in to to create these results on demand, right? Instead of uh, on accident, because I imagine like that's how your business shifted, right? And so can you share some some little nuggets with our listeners on how how they can find their own story? Well, absolutely. Number one, well, let's address what you just said, because so many people I talk with, and I bet you've had the same experience, Wes, they'll tell me, I haven't done anything special. Who would want to hear my story? And there's a, a, a two questions I ask in every workshop I do, and I'll ask the group, raise your hand if you've ever climbed Mount Everest if you've found uh, sunken ships at the bottom of the ocean or you've won Olympic gold, well, nobody raises was, their hand. I was on top of Mount Everest when I radioed up to my satellite and I found Noah's Ark. But, I mean, that, okay, I mean, you're that, not allowed to come to my workshop. That was different. Just the whole thing. I usually don't <laughs> tell people that. You're only the first one I've ever told that. So, But I, I get your point. Yeah. And, and I'll ask them to look around the room. Nobody's raising their hands. Right. And then I ask, have you ever had a conflict with a coworker? Mm-hmm. Ever had financial difficulty or maybe struggled to communicate with a child? And everybody's hand is up. And yep. I say, look, there's your proof. You have stories that other people need to hear and they will relate to. Right. So first of all, it's understanding you do have stories. You don't have to have done something famous or spectacular for people to want to listen to you. Right. The next step is to know your audience. Last week, I had the opportunity to speak to a local group of health, uh, not health, but um, human resources professionals. And this question came up, and I said, always know the group you're speaking with. If they're professionals, you've got to have certain stories available. If it's sales professionals, have sales stories. If it's leaders, I think you see where I'm going with this. You have to have a bank of stories. Trust that those day-to-day stories that you go through are valuable because they are. Now, uh, so I just had a guest on that does uh, training, and he's more on like with big companies, and he they've trained at Cisco for like 17 years um, right. in that world. Um, and, and I asked him this question as well. You know, how much – do you rely on visuals like PowerPoint versus just walking the room and engaging people? I rarely use PowerPoint. Okay. If I can find a, a picture or a video that will support my point, I'll use it. And I will tell you, Wes, I am almost the opposite. I am the opposite of most people who present I rarely have used it. I need to start incorporating it into my presentations, I believe, because as audiences are getting younger, I'm not getting older. They're getting younger. I know how that works. (laughs) (laughs) 
I have to put some in. And in fact, I saw a great presentation last year from John Molidor. He is the current president of the National Speakers Association. He's a brain scientist who's also a great speaker. I didn't know the two could go together, but he, there he is. So he's he the president of the NSA? Yeah, NSA okay. this year, yes. Yeah. He gave great insight into how the brain works and how to use visuals to really liven up your presentation. And he's he made me rethink it. <laughs> so I'm I'm going to start incorporating, but they have to be pictures and they have to be or, or they have to be videos. I'm not going to put words on the screen. Uh, Stories uh, take the place of is that. Is that a talk like can we is it on YouTube or something, or was that like just for the NSA members? I saw him speak at an NSA event. I'm okay. not sure if he's got that on YouTube or not. Uh, okay. He's a very approachable guy, though. I get, yeah. get in touch of his last name spelled M O L I D O R. I do believe he has something on YouTube. I think I did see something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, it's interesting. I mean, because I'm always I'm struggling with that as well because I will, golly, I mean, I can put hours and days and weeks into a presentation. Yes. Um, and I, personally, I'd rather walk a room. I'd rather have a whiteboard, you know, a flip chart, draw some notes. Um, but I mean, I know what you're saying. I mean, the audience is getting younger and I don't know. I mean, that John's a smart dude, so I'm going to go research him and look up the facts. Right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but I'm also I, I, human nature doesn't change. Right. And maybe because yeah. everybody is flashy and using stuff, maybe it's good to be different. Right. And, and absolutely still capture their attention by looking at them in the eye, you know, and having a conversation. Yeah, and it depends. if you're doing a keynote, almost never use PowerPoints or slides because the key point, sh- the key uh, keynote should be all about stories and, right. and proving your point. If you're doing training, you have to have yes. visuals. Training's you different. Can't get away from yes. Those. Yes. Uh, but I, I'm just a huge believer that stories create visual pictures in the minds of the audience that they, I mean, they create their own pictures and that's what I want them doing. Right. And so, so based on how we open, you know, you got those four things. I mean, so you're, you're so showing up, you're speaking, you're presenting to sell, right? So how can we help our listeners overcome uh, their nerves, their, their concerns about it, you know, cause I, I've always spoken about this, you know, I've, I've always been a good presenter from an educational standpoint and even entertaining, right? Mm-hmm. People are like, Oh, that was so good. And blah, blah, blah. But like, I, I wouldn't sell much. Right? Yes. So it's like, Hey, I gotta, I gotta shift gears here. Uh, I don't get paid to be entertaining. Um, right. You know, so how, did you struggle with that ever or, or do you have? Oh, absolutely. Tips? Oh, absolutely. We talked about Covey before begin with the end in mind. Right. Whenever I work with somebody putting together a speech, any kind of presentation, the first question is what is the end result? What do you want people to do when you're done? And it's not always buy something. It may be sign up for my I know we talked about something I offer, 52 storytelling tips. That's it. Just get you into my system so you can get to know more about me. I'm not asking you to buy per se on the spot. If it was the financial workshops that I used to do, absolutely we wanted people to sign up at the end for a one-to-one meeting. We're not asking them to buy on the spot, but we're getting them into that sales process so we can start to gain their trust that they can see we do offer something of value. And at the end, yes, we want you to buy. Right. Do you, do you think that makes you maybe a little more relaxed? Cause, cause it's like, Hey, I'm not asking them to buy a, a $80,000 timeshare, right? I'm asking them oh, yeah. to opt in for something for free to schedule a free consultation. Um, so do, do you think you maybe, maybe our listeners are going for too big of the kill, right? And instead of taking maybe an incremental step in what, in what they should be selling. Yes. And, and, <laughs> If your listeners haven't done it, they need to go watch your TEDx talk. <laughs> I, I loved it, and I watched it uh, <laughs> earlier today again. And, and you said something in there, and I might be paraphrasing what you said, Wes, but you said, I was a marketer trapped in a salesperson's body. Right. I grew up – I'm not a hard-driving, super-aggressive person. Right. I love that concept that it, you're dripping to lack of, to use the old term about marketing. You're dripping on people. You're saying, "Hey, here's a little piece of what I do and how I do it, mm-hmm. why I do it." 
And maybe we it, it, I equate it to the dating process. Yeah. Yeah. Selling. I've met so many people who want to, for lack of a better term, consummate the deal on the spot. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. You've got to court someone. Yeah. You've got to go through this process. And it, to answer your question from earlier, it, it does take a lot of the pressure off. And it, that gets rid of a lot of the nerves right there. You know that you're not just going in for the kill. Right. Just trying to develop a relationship with people. Now, Speaking is just a different way of doing that. Are you sprinkling in, you know, uh, you know, from a sales world, right? Trial closes, like mentioning that during the presentation, or do you just give your talk and then maybe at the end you just wrap it up with, you know, who would like to learn more? Who would like to continue the conversation? You know, I've got a little something for you. You know what I mean? Do you, are, Actually, are you dripping on them or do you just go for the big, even though it's a simple no, close, right? Opt in for something, uh, you know, is it a, is it a stark transition and you end with that? No, we drip it throughout. One okay. of my coaches is a brilliant speaker and brilliant salesperson. His name is Craig Valentine, and he has a program that some of the top speakers in the world actually use. It's called Back of the Room Sales, Mastering Back of the Room Sales. And one of the concepts he talks about is sprinkle throughout the product service that you're trying to promote. He said, if you, if you wait to the end, it feels and looks like a sales pitch, and it is. Whereas if you just mention it throughout and then move on, don't linger on it. As an example, I might say early in my presentation, uh, my client Patty, when she listened to step five of my 52 storytelling tips, picked up an idea that made a huge difference when she gave her presentation. And then I move on. Right. So that by the time three-fourths of the way in, when I offer the 52 storytelling tips, the people have heard it two or three times, and it's not something new. And I've created a desire in them to want to have it because I've given examples through other stories of how other clients have benefited from it. Right. I'm and also sending a subliminal message that, hey, I'm a coach. You can right. hire me. Right. And then – if you're not using a lot of slides, though, I mean, do you have a slide for that? Hey, who would like more? I have this. Or do you just kind of mention it and throw out a URL so it's more seems more off the cuff sort of, you know, no, versus pre-planned? I, here's what I've done, and I've tested this in different ways using technology. And I go back to an old 20th century tool, a clipboard and a sign-up sheet. Get, what I did, get out of here. I'm not kidding you. I got this from one of my other coaches. He's, he's a great marketer. And he said to me, try this one time. <laughs> and I get probably 88% of the room to sign up for my 52 tips when I do the clipboard method. Nice. And what I do about halfway through is I'll ask, and I, and I do want to know this, are you getting good ideas? Are you getting good benefit from this? And if they say yes, hopefully they do. I'll say, would you like to become a three times better as a storyteller over the next 12 months? Again, they'll say yes. I said, well, good. What I've got here is an opportunity for you to sign up for a free resource. It's my list. Nobody else gets it. Sign up for it. 52 storytelling tips. You, once a week, you get a five-minute audio, and you get a, a downloadable PDF transcription of that lesson, and one skill builds on top of another. In right. one year, you'll be at least three times better. And eighty eight percent. So do you do you have a bunch you passing around or do you they wait till the end or do you pass around during your talk? I do it about halfway through because I discovered through trial and error if I wait too long, then I I might have people that are interested, but I miss out because they have to leave. Yeah. So I want to give them enough content. And I did this when I spoke to the human resource group the other day. I had fifty minutes, about twenty five minutes in, I Put a little. Uh, I had an alarm set on my phone. Nice. And when it went off, I put. I said, "Oh, I'm so sorry. I should have turned that off before I started." Didn't bother <laughs> the flow of my presentation. It was a reminder because sometimes I get so into my presentation I forget to do it. Sure. So I need to cheat a little bit. And That's I had. Awesome. I think there were like 60 people in the room and something like 52 signed up. Um, but yeah, I, I've tried them all, Wes, and that still is the best format to get names. So, I mean, do you have three or four clipboards up front and you pass them out or what do you do? Yes, I do. Okay. Each sheet has, I think, 20 places to sign up. Right. I actually didn't take enough last time. 
I, if I have, um, I like to take one clipboard for every 15 people. Yeah. Now I was told there would only be 30 in this audience. There were twice as many. So oh, wow. again, still learning, always take more clipboards. And I don't know why I didn't do it, but I got the names anyway. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because I, um, I've gone old school and uh, a friend of mine, Pete Vargas, I need to have him on the show. Um, he's really good. He books speakers. He speaks a lot himself. Uh, and, you know, he said, just have a little pre-done handout uh, and just place them on the seats and um, and have them fill it out. And, and that has worked very well for me, uh, having it there early. Right? He said the most he ever did was some ungodly thousands. He said, I think it was like the – PTA meeting or something like in Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got there like 90 minutes early and put one on every seat. Um, okay. And, um, uh, and that worked. And, and, and I see, cause again, knowing your, your audience, when I speak to a high tech audience, I'll, I'll have them opt in with text or something, but I think a lot of people are kind of leery of opting in and, and different things. It's funny. They're opting in on paper, but to opt in on their phone or with text, it, I, I like this old school manner. Uh, you know, that's an interesting more open. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting point you bring up. I hadn't thought about it. There is more of a comfort level. Something about writing and touching paper is more trustworthy to people, especially older individuals. I think the problem is people can't write for for Jack Doodley Squat, so you can't read <laughs> yes. the dang thing. Now, because of my initials, here's another advantage. I say to them. <laughs> Now, please write <laughs> legibly. And I'm not saying that because of your handwriting. I say it because my initials are MD and I write like one. Mm -hmm. So it's a great little line. It works every time. And it's more self-deprecating rather than saying to them, hey, please, would you write? And even though I tell them, I'd say one of every 10, I can't read. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and do you just ask for like first name and, and email? Do you ask for phone number or cell phone? I I ask for uh, name and email only. Yeah. Anything more than that, I'm not going to get to everybody, and I think they'll start to balk if I ask for more than the name and email. Yeah, that's the catch twenty two, man. The, the more you, <laughs> the more you ask for, you know, the better, the better the lead is, but the fewer number you'll get. Absolutely, and I want them to keep that thing passing around. It, it does my heart good when I see people standing up during my presentation, walking the clipboard over to someone else. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I mean, it's just it's so true. Um, so when you're, you know, you got the room, you're, you're telling your stories. I mean, how do you, if you're not using a lot of slides, I mean, have you done this long enough that, you, you know, lack of a better term, you just do it on the fly? Like you kind of know where you're going or, or do you write this out? You know, uh, how do you personally prepare and, and choose the right story. And, and, and do you ad lib, you know, like sprinkle in others, maybe kind of like with the, the women that first time, you know, like, oh, man, you know, I'm going left. It's, I'm going to go right now <laughs> after what I see. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, I, I, I need to know who's in my audience as, as much as I can. What right. type of group am I speaking to? Is it healthcare professionals? Is it marketers? Is it human resource? So I've got stories that I can use. Now, I told the story of the first time I gave my financial workshop to this group of human resource uh, professionals. Right. You'd think on the surface the two didn't match, but it's the way I introduced the power of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And it worked. So you've got to know who you're speaking with. You have to have a bank of stories ready to go. Right. So if, if somebody does ask me a question out of left field, I can answer it. But it goes back to a point you just made when you asked the question. You've got to prepare. Right. There's just no other way around it. If you don't prepare, you end up writing out an entire speech that you read, and your, your chances for connection are nil. Right. When you read a speech at someone. So I know my subject. I've been teaching it now for eight years. So I know it like the back of my hand so I can pivot. Now, that's not – I'm not patting myself on the back to say that. It's just anybody who the best of the best. Um, I heard this statistic a year or two ago, and it really surprised me. But the highest paid speakers tend to give their speeches 200 times before they get paid. 
And wow. we're talking speakers that make $10,000 and up. They give those speeches so much. And we're talking 45-minute keynotes often. They give it so much they can do it in their sleep. Yeah. And you said, I hate to sound preachy, but are you willing to put in that kind of time to be that good where you will get paid that kind of money because you know it so well that nothing bothers you on stage? Right. Yeah, and just being that calm. Yeah, well, my coach has taught me that we're not paid to give great speeches. We're paid to handle problems when they come up when we're on stage uh, because they are going to come up. Very interesting take on it. Well, yes. How often are you doing like a keynote versus like a, like a local event with those women? I mean, because I got to imagine like our listeners, you know, that keynoting is it's there's not as many people doing it, you know, but they can speak at the local, you know, chamber of commerce. They can speak at, um, a real estate association, you know, a county meeting with 30, 40, 50 agents. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so is the, is the process and the preparation the same, regardless of the size of the audience? Essentially. Yes. To answer your question, I do a lot more training than I do keynotes. I mean, okay. I, I have keynotes, I do them, but much more often I'm doing training. And in fact, I heard this not long ago, and I'm, I'm rounding off the numbers a little bit, but there are like 10 times more trainers than there are keynoters, at least in the professional world. Right. There are very few people who just do keynotes in this age. Right. They're trainers. They're, there are several reasons for that we won't get into now, but I would suggest if you want to do keynotes, if you want to do training, you have to go out and get that message honed in. And where do you do that? It's the groups you just mentioned. You go to your local associations, your real estate groups, your farmers groups, your Toastmasters uh, clubs. Get in there because nothing beats practice in front of live people. Yeah. Standing in a room speaking to yourself talking to the bushes in the backyard, giving it to your dog. Those are great for trying to get the words and the rhythm and the flow. But until you can see how people are reacting to what you say, you're not ready to get paid well. Let's say you're not ready to get paid a high amount of money right. to give a speech. Yeah, but that's a good point, though. I mean, there's great money in training. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, my best year income-wise uh, was – a year with my team, uh, at Dell. Um, that was big money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was <Yeah>. easy money. <laughs> yeah. That reminds me, I need to call them. Cause, uh, yeah, they just went private. <laughs> Sometimes you wonder why did I leave there? That was pretty good money. <laughs> yeah. That was beyond my control. I'm still in touch with them actually. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what a, that was a good deal. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I think, I think we see the glamorous, the keynote speaker, uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean that's a good advice for every every one of those fancy people on stage. There's ten people doing great training, making great money. Yeah, and I'll share a quick story with you that emphasizes why the best speakers are the best speakers. You know the name Patricia Fripp. Oh, that's so funny. I just All spoke right. to her. Yeah, she's a client. <laughs> yeah, Patricia is the lady in Lady and the Champs that I mentioned uh, oh, to gotcha. you at the event. Well, last year I was there because uh, I am one of the coaches on the uh, with the group that does this pre uh, this event, and I look back on the second day about halfway through in the afternoon, and I see Patricia over in the corner, and I think she's talking to herself. And then I watched much more closely, and I saw that she was doing her speech. I mean, it was as if the whole room was in front of her, and this is probably 20 minutes before she's about to go on stage. And I took a picture of it and I talked to her later. I said, do you mind if I share this online? Because I want people to understand that whatever you do, but especially as a speaker, if you want to be the best and be treated and paid like that, you are you never stop working at it. I mean, she could do this speech in her sleep mm -hmm. and yet she was still practicing. She didn't care who was watching None of that. She was doing it out in the open mm -hmm. with the whole world to see if they wanted to watch. But right. she gets – that's why she's so good at what she does. Mm -hmm. well, Zig Ziglar always talked about it. You know, he said he would, he would practice for three hours every mm -hmm. day before he'd give his talk. You know, he said, I'm giving this talk you know, thousands of times. 
Yeah. Uh, it's like, oh, interesting. <laughs> That's, I mean, you could, we can spin every technique, put every process in we want, but it, I hate to sound cliche. And like I said, I don't want to sound preachy, but that is the way to do it. Yeah. Um, I would say there's a reason. I don't know if you're a football fan at all. There's a reason the New England Patriots keep winning. Yeah. Yes, they've got great players, but they also have a system, and they work harder than any team out there probably. Yeah, they do. They get after it. Yep. All right, man, parting words of wisdom. I like to ask, you know, imagine our listeners are they're jogging, they're biking, they're on a plane with no Wi-Fi, they can't do anything yet, but the moment that they can after listening to this, what do you want them to do? What should they do to get better at speaking? Find some group to go talk to. <laughs> Get it on your schedule. I don't care if your speech is ready, if your story's ready, it doesn't matter. My, uh, f- my one of my coaches, Darren Lacroix, taught me: done is better than perfect. Yeah. Get the momentum going. Don't wait until the story's perfect. Don't wait till the speech is completely internal- internalized. Go screw up. Yeah, because it's in the mistakes that you learn where you need to get better. And you'll also learn what you're already doing well. Right. Yeah, and especially if you are new, I mean, you're not going to get some high profile gig anyway. No. Uh, so you're going to screw up in front of five or 10 or 15 people. Yes. And they'll feel for you and they'll help you get better anyway. <laughs> yeah, and I'll share something with you from the speech I did last week. I did something. I was telling a story of someone and I, I changed the name to protect the innocent kind of thing. Well, a little bit later in the speech, I said a different name, which was really my client's name. And oh. the place just busted out laughing. Oh, <laughs> I gosh. just said, all right, I'm just going to say his name. <laughs> and I asked them, I said, did I just lose credibility with you? He said, no, of course not. I said, that's a reminder. Don't ever worry about making mistakes because you're going to do it. Right. It's when you make a big deal about it is when it becomes a problem. Well, I was like in the military, you know, whatever you let them know bothers you, that becomes your nickname. (laughs) (laughs) So you just got to roll with it. Exactly. (laughs) Oh, man. All right, Michael Davis, the storytelling MD. We're going to send everybody to speakingcpr.com. You've got uh, the 52 storytelling tips. It's uh, down, I don't know, three quarters of the way on the on the right. Um, we'll make sure uh, and link to that. And um, thanks for coming on the sales podcast, man. It's been great. Look for, uh, I enjoyed it myself and I look forward to talking with you again soon, Wes. All right, man. Have a great day. All right. You too. Bye-bye. If you want to grow your business, you need to learn how to speak. You need to learn how to persuade. And to do that, you must tell stories. That is what gets into people's psyche. It it touches their emotion. Um, It bypasses the logical left brain and gets right in to the heart of the matter. You know, that's why... We love stories as kids. It's why we love stories as adults. You know, you see adults standing in line for Harry Potter movies, for Star Wars. You know, it just, once that little spark is is lit, it's created, it's found, it never goes away. So tell stories. There's a lady, I need to look up her book, but it was something like, wake me when when the data is over. You know, tell stories. Learn how to speak. When you're on stage, when you're in front of the audience, you're the expert. And people will listen to you. They will follow you. They will follow your advice. They will buy from you. They, they will do what you recommend because you're speaking. Okay? Uh, and weave in stories. Michael's got some great advice in there. Um, I love the fact he's not dependent on PowerPoint. Uh, and if you do use slides, use big pictures, use very few words. Use big font. Use the slides really as your outline to remind you where to take things. If somebody were to steal your slides, they should not be able to give your presentation. That means there's just there's images, there's, there's movement, there's transitions that they won't understand. Right? It's not a bunch of words 
on, on a screen. So presenting and speaking are so important to your career. Uh, so get good at that. Let me tell you a couple of things that are going to help you with that. And I've made some changes uh, to the Make Every Sale program. If you head over to makeeverysale.com, you have a couple of options to enroll at a one-time super affordable price for lifetime access to me and my material and my group or 12 monthly payments. And in there, this is my only program that I'm working on right now. It's my only program for the foreseeable future. And we do live training. We do uh, supplemental training. I'm going to be bringing in guest experts. We're going to get live Q&A with them. But you get access to me online all the time. You want to pick my brain? 97 bucks a month for 12 months, and then you have access for life. Okay? I can't make it any more affordable than that. Uh, or a one-time payment for less than that if you want to save $167. In there, it, it's all fair game. How do I get speaking gigs? How have I written my books? How have my, I produced my podcast? How do I close the sale? Uh, how do you handle retail sales? How do you overcome objections? Um, how do you weave stories into a presentation? You know, I may be especially generous one day and just review your landing page, review your presentation. So I don't know how to make it more affordable for you than that. So head on over to make every sale.com. Got a big old landing page there. I'm probably gonna make a new video. I don't really like the video at the top, but Hey, it works. Uh, we can scroll through, read the information. So if you want to get better at selling, and when I say make every sale, it doesn't mean just making every opportunity, like closing every single deal. It's a, it's a double entendre, I guess. It means, yes, doing what you can to close every deal, make every sale, but also there is a ton, there are a lot of nuances in a sale. How do you greet somebody? How do you title or create a headline in an email? What do you do in direct mail? What type of multimedia, multi-step sequences should you use to move that sale along? Each one of those are little sales that must be made sequentially, in order, at the right pace. And that is what I've done full-time to provide for a family of nine now since 1997. So I think I know a thing or two about it. Um, and, you know, when I got serious about growing my own skills, I hired a coach. I joined a program. And I did get – I got great Okay. I was good before, but I was good because I was stubborn. I was good because I hustled. I was good because I was always curious and always grinding, but life isn't about grinding. Yes. You got to work hard. Yes. You got to put in uh, the hours, but it shouldn't be painful. It shouldn't be miserable. There should be light at the end of the tunnel. And you get that light when you're surrounded with good people, when you've got a good coach, when you've got a good mentor and you're doing the right things the right way in the right order at the right time. Okay. So do me a favor, do yourself a favor, check out make every and enroll today, then become an affiliate and I'll pay you for every one you tell about the course. How cool is that? Better than, um, poking the eye with a sharp stick, right? Um, so thanks for listening. Okay. Please go check that out. Enroll today make every sale.com. And then I will help you sell more faster at higher margin with less stress and more fun. And I guarantee it. One other thing, check out what my buddy Jay is doing over at VA staffer. Uh, he's been a sponsor now. Uh, good guy. I work with him. He hustles. Uh, he's honest, he's accessible. Uh, and he has an offer for my listeners. That means you, uh, you get four free hours with his staff to work on anything you need. And then if you enroll, you'll save a hundred dollars, uh, off your first month. And his rates are unbelievably affordable, unbelievably affordable. Okay. Uh, you can access that at the saleswhisper.com forward slash V a staffer. So VA stands for virtual admin. So, the salesforce.com forward slash VA staffer.
Thanks for listening. And as always, remember to sell different.